<clears throat> John Thorne. This is Dennis, Dennis Camp, Amarillo, Texas. I'm not booked. John, it's kind of unbelievable. I'm sitting in the <clears throat> Dallas airport with Terry Funk, who had changed his flight, and he's on standby and he can't get on. So here's the irony I'm booked, and Terry's not. <laughs> he's fighting with the girl at the desk, and he's flattened when he's priority, but she ain't paying any attention to him. He's in. We're already overbooked, so I just said that's funny, but it is nice to be able to sit and talk to him a little bit. But uh, I want to thank you guys once again for uh, treating me like, like somebody special. I really do appreciate it. Thank you guys very much. This is a special bonus episode for our good friend, uh, the late Dennis Stamp. Uh, this is the audio from an interview Pedro De Luca conducted with him back in 2015 when we booked him. Um, I'm sure we will have a full episode on our time and the impact and all that that Dennis Stamp had on us. But uh, we just kind of wanted to get this out there um, since you know he is fresh in everyone's thoughts and gives give everyone a, a better idea of uh, what a great person Dennis Stamp was. Thanks. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another edition of Behind the Curtain for Absolute Intense Wrestling. I am Pedro DeLuca, your host. Today, I have a an awesome special guest with me. <laughs> the legendary Dennis Stamp is with me here today. Dennis, thank you so much for joining me here today. Oh, thank you. Dennis, the, the whole purpose of these Behind the Curtains, we've seen you in the ring. We know what you can do, but we wanted to see what makes up the man Dennis Stamp. <laughs> so first of all, what was that one thing that made you want to get into this crazy business that is professional wrestling? Well, the, the real major turning point in my life was when I won the state uh, state championship in wrestling in high school uh, when I was in uh, uh, in Brainerd, Minnesota when I was in high school and I had come out of just abject poverty I, I had no esteem at all I had very low self-esteem but once I stood up on that top block where it says one underneath it I didn't come actually down off that block for about two or three weeks. I walked on air for about two or three weeks. And to a certain degree, I've never come all the way down off that okay. block. It, rightly or wrongly, it, the message I got from that was that I'm somebody special as a wrestler for sure. Maybe not in anything else, but for sure in wrestling. And I wanted to continue wrestling. Now, you're not going to find many people who say, they wrestled in high school and college, and that's why they wanted to be a pro, because there's a whole lot of difference right. there. But what I am is a wrestler, and I feel so lucky because of amateur wrestling, it's a clique. Mm -hmm. It's a brotherhood, really. Yes, yes. We have sisters now that wrestle, but it's essentially a brotherhood, and I'm very, very proud to be a part of that brotherhood. I refereed, actually, amateur wrestling the last... I, I quit a couple years ago. I stopped. But... Uh, for 25 years, I, I refereed in, out into my 60s. Okay. And I refereed state tournaments, uh, of course, regional tournaments. I refereed two AAU Grand Nationals, three Sambo Nationals, an NCAA tournament. So I've been fully involved as a wrestler my whole life. But professional wrestling is a different clique. It's the same situation. It's a tighter clique, actually. Mm -hmm. It's the same situation. And I'm fully vested in being in both cliques. And to the point at times where I don't know exactly which one I want to be a part of. And I love being at the tournaments. And I love now my granddaughter's wrestling. And i back with the old coaches and the referees and all. And I love those people. And I love being with them. And I'm thinking one day, what would I rather be with, the amateurs or the pros? And I think about being with Terry Funk for five minutes. And there's no contest. <laughs> When, if, if you get my book and read it, one of the stories in there, which is very, very close to me and very moving, is at my worst, okay, they told me, they were talking hospice. I mean, I went to hospital, I had, my pulse was 300, and I had fourth stage fast growing non Hodgkin's lymphoma. And uh, I guess I had uh, uh, leukemia as well. So, they're talking about hospice. I mean, I'm in, the, I'm in the conversation and the doctors are talking about hospice. Well, 
I mean, made me kind of a dummy, but I understand hospice would be a distance. You right. know, you have to have a distance to qualify for it. Right. So it was pretty much to the edge there, you know. And then I had forty, at least forty visitors the first two days. All my referee friends and wrestlers and family. My one of my daughters flew in from Korea. She's teaching in Korea, and a lot of them had come to say goodbye. Right. Because the word was, hey, the old man's on his way out, you know. So they came to say goodbye. So um, it, it was, it was a, it was kind of a tough time. And uh, now, so, but um, I got past it somehow. The they gave me the strongest chemotherapy you could get, and I had to take it. I would be the first one there, and I'd be the last one to go. And I'd be on that this thing for like seven or eight hours. And it was miserable. You know, I lost all my hair all over my body. The at the eyelashes I missed the work most because it gets soap in my eyes. I didn't, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, took away all my coordination. I bet I fell down 15 times after the chemotherapy, and even months after it, you know. And, and so it was it was pretty rough. But I don't know. I just kept. I just kept. Bouncing around, and the one thing about the chemo, one thing about the chemotherapy, my first MRI, you could see the cancer was all over my body, all these different places. The first MRI, the only other MRI I did was after I finished chemotherapy, and it was n there was not a speck, not a speck anywhere. The doctor couldn't even believe it. She said, one time she even said, she looked at this, she said, I don't even think this is the same person because it wasn't my doctor, she was taking this place that day. She says, this doesn't even look like it could be the same person. This one, there's nothing, it's completely clear. So what I did was, I took that to be cancer free, okay? Right. Now I'm cancer free. I have proof in my mind. You, you can't, unless you believe it, it, it won't be true. Right. So I believe that I'm cancer free. I cut loose from my heart doctor and my cancer doctor. I just said, no, when I go to you, you check my blood, you think, well, these numbers are this, these numbers are that, you get me worried. I said, I don't have that many years left. I can't spend all that time worrying about not dying. Right. I gotta worry about living, you know? None of us can stop it. I mean, Father Time catches us at the end, everybody, you know? None of us can stop it. That isn't the point. The point is, what can you? How much can you squeeze in before he shows up? Right. You know, let's let's live a little bit. So, to my to his everlasting credit, and to my with my undying love, Chris Duke is a, a man from Scotland has a wrestling radio show, and he found out about how sick I was, and he called me, and then he he liked talking to me, so he called me back and he said, I'm gonna have you on my show. So, after the first time I was on his show. He said, I'd like to have you on every week. Could you do that? And so I, for 20 weeks in a row until I went to a different radio station, I did a segment on his show every week in Scotland. I told stories. And it started out with uh, five minutes. The five went, went to 10, and it went to 12. And when it started to approach 15, I told him, I said, Chris, you need to try to hold me to 10. <laughs> I don't want to steal your show. Plus... I don't want people to get sick of me either. <laughs> so I don't get too much of a, you know, e e even uh, even wedding cake or whatever, the richest dessert, you can only eat so much of it. As good as it may taste, if you eat too much of it, you're going to get sick of it. So you can have too much of a good thing. So I, uh, I I backed off, but we did, so I had to hold it to 10 minutes, but we did uh, 20, 20 different shows, I remember. And then I just started writing. And I wrote, I've written poems and, and, and stories. Actually, I wrote short stories that are all true. They're things that have happened to me. What my, my, my thinking was to try to tell, give people some sort of an insight of what it feels like mm -hmm. from the perspective from inside the ring, from being the wrestler. And so I gave them different perspectives. Tough guy is one of my stories. And fear is one of my stories. I tell about, I'd be short on camera, but I got a knot on my head where I got hit with a whisk, bottle of whiskey when I was wrestling in Japan in 1971. But the scar's still, still there. there. You <laughs> I see, see it, it? yeah. It's down from what it was, I can tell you, but uh, that was pretty scary. I was, we were in a little town in Japan, and 
the Japanese people are very, uh, well, they're, pri they're, they're private people in a way, and they, they, they have such pride that, that to look bad in any way, in any form, to them, is called, they call it face, to be losing face. Mm -hmm. So they won't, they all have to take English from the time they start school, but they won't, none of them speak it to you because they're afraid they won't get it quite right somehow. Mm -hmm. So, the, get this, wakano nai, which means I don't understand. Wakano nai, always with their hand in front of their face. Wakano nai, I heard that so many times, I remember it 45 years ago. Wakano nai. So, I'm, I'm bleeding, I'm in a tag match. Blood all, I, I put my hand up, I, first, my first thought was, what a waste of whiskey, because this is blood. <laughs> and so I put my hand up there, and I bring it down, it's just covered with blood. And so, Red Bastine is my partner. I'm on the outside of the ring. I go back up on the apron. He looks at me. What the hell happened to you, kid? <laughs> he grabs my hair and pulls it up. He goes, well, you didn't get your eye. He said, I'll finish the match. Go get something to stop the bleeding. So, I've never seen this before, and I've been in every level of amateur wrestling matches and tournaments and, and duels and every kind of professional matches. They had a little table with two nurses at it, at a wrestling match. I had never seen that before, <laughs> ever. What, well, this was still the day when they all wore the white uniforms and the white hats. So I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm saved. So I go up to this little table where these nurses are. They may still be running. <laughs> <laughs> it's 40 years ago. They saw me coming. Oh, I mean, they're gone. They just took off. There was no way they were going to talk to me. So now I can't get anybody to talk to me. Hey. Finally, my friend Belinsky, Bo Belinsky, was on the card with me. And he finally found me and got a towel. And he was, you know, I'm petrified, scared. Now I maybe lost a quarter of blood by then. At one point, I was catching it. I had a double cup of my blood. <laughs> I'm catching it. And I go, What in the fuck are you doing? <laughs> you can't put it back. <laughs> and. So, and then I finally, I said, it, it finally hit me, where is that son of a bitch? And so the police had him and they were hauling him off. Now, the next day I had to go downtown Tokyo police station to sign something. So the promoters, I was so stupid at the time anyway. I'm not that I'm really brighter today. <laughs> but the, the, the promoters didn't want me to file charges, but I didn't care. I wasn't filing, I wouldn't file, I, I wasn't going to file charges on him. Now I, I see him, this little man, he was drunk when he did it. He's maybe four foot eight, I mean he's tiny. And he is crying, they told him I was coming to the police station. He's scared out of his mind. He is, the, the Japanese people, at least at that time, the working people, they would carry a little towel, like I'd call it a tea towel, it's bigger than a handkerchief, but more like terry cloth. And, he was crying so much that he would wring, bring this out and be wringing the tears out of it. He was so scared. I'm sitting there, I'm like a mummy with a, I got a clip in my nose, I got stitches in my head and I'm taped up, you know, with all this tape around me and my hair's sticking out because he, he's like, no water, you can't wash it, don't wash it. So I'm feeling bad for this little man. And then he was a farm laborer he had six children, and he made a hundred dollars a month. Wow! So, but to get out of jail, he had to the, he had to call the owner of the farm and the manager of the farm had to come and get him. Oh! So they're in suits and ties, uh -huh. and I'm thinking, oh man, I all felt bad for him. I said, damn, my head has gotten him in more trouble than he deserves. You know, he's gonna pay big time for this. He had that. He had to pay the hospital bill, which was like forty dollars. I let him do that. I let him. Of course, they probably just took it out of his pay. I'm not, I'm not sure what they did about it, but uh, I'd already made up my mind that I wasn't filing charges against him, and I didn't, you know. And and as it happens, I didn't give you the, quite the situation of what 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 came to it. But we were on the floor fighting, and the the big guy, uh, giant uh, Kasatsu, he was hit me with chop. Bang, bang, I was just draped up against the apron. And all of a sudden, the little man just steps up behind me with a brown paper sack, went boom. Mm. But I, still to this day, 
I feel like it was my fault. I should have known. I should have. If you're gonna if you're gonna wrestle now, you know, people think maybe this is show or show business or part of it. But you have to be prepared for whatever. You never know what what's going to happen. And the and the more you, the more irritated and agitated the fans get, the more likely they are to do something silly or something stupid. And then when you add alcohol to any situation, it just makes it makes it crazy, you know. So uh, I always felt like it was part of my fault. The real downside of it was, to me, was the Japanese promoters never wanted me back. Now, they had me in the main events. I hadn't even been in business. I had been working six months. I was in the main event that night that I got hit. And they had sold my next matches to TV, which they only sold one match. And it was in mine, there were, there were uh, how many of us there? About eight of us foreigners there. And I was by far and away the greenest. But what I didn't realize at the time, they were way into lawsuits before we were here, and they were worried because they were the the owners and the promoters were who were responsible and who were ultimately reliable right. for what happened, and they didn't want me to come. If I don't come back in the country, I can never sue them. Right. But I might stay out if I, I'm out three or four years. Even I come back, I, I, I probably could have still sued them. But uh, I, that, that, the thought of suing anybody was the furthest thing from my mind. I never even, I never even considered it. Well, before Japan, and before we, we jumped way ahead there, let's, let's get back to the start of your career. Okay, so you, you, when you tell me it's going to be nice and easy, I just laugh <laughs> because I said it might be nice and easy for you, but then you're going to have to deal with me, and that might not be so easy. You, you're state champion in amateur wrestling. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm assuming. Someone saw you as the sandwich of wrestling. You, you want to continue on in your wrestling okay. career? Then I went wrestling in college. Okay. I wrestled four years in college. And I uh, went to a uh, Concordia College, Moorhead, Minnesota. They were the defending NAIA champions okay. in football. And at that time, in the, in the middle 60s, there was the NCAA, which was the university division, and then there was the NAIA. They didn't have Division Two and Division Three okay. at that time. So it was like 600 schools. It was a big deal, but small schools. So, this is who I am. The first day, there's probably 120 freshmen want to be on this championship team. I wanted to be on the wrestling team, but they said, what well, 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 you are, you are, but just go out for football. And as long as you don't quit, if you don't like it, you can quit at the end of the season. But just as long as you don't, you, 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 we'll, we'll give you a scholarship to wrestle. But you know, as long as you play football. But football owns everything. Wrestling, they could care less. And so... They called, they line up the defending national championship team first day, first day of practice. And they say, okay, we need hamburger, which were freshmen. So, okay, we need volunteers to go line up against the varsity. I was the only one. 120 <laughs> freshmen. I was the only one that walked out there. And the freshman coach who had been the quarterback on that team the year before, he, he goes, he just shakes his head, he says, one lone Brainerd warrior. And so that kind of has been like a, a subtext of my life, one lone brainerd warrior, because I've been on my own. The one thing about wrestling, you need a connection, you need a promoter, you need somebody to promote you, which I never had. As a matter of fact, I generally rub promoters wrong because they loved my matches and they loved that I was the one that would put in all the time they wanted no matter what and I would work extra no matter what. I would work with anybody. I could put anybody over and still look good. I could talk. They finally let me, to, they finally gave me a few chances here and there to draw and I drew. I sold out Colorado Springs. It had never been done before. They turned people away and they never did it again after me. But. What I finally figured out was, once I got that point where I could draw, it didn't, you'd think they'd want people that could work, that could talk, that could have good matches, that got along with everybody, that could teach other people how to do it. But when they found out I could also make money, then I became a total threat. So I went from the top to the bottom. And it was all out of jealousy, you know. And but the business, like all business, are run by power. It's, mm-hmm. 
it's not. It's like the WWE now. I think it's lost. A, I haven't seen much of it because I don't watch it. I watched a lot of the 90s. I watched a lot of the uh, WrestleManias. But today, it's lost what I consider, it's lost its luster. It doesn't have a shine to it like it used to. Okay. It, the, the people seem much more ordinary to me than they used to. But when they were first going, there were 20 regional territories uh -huh. that had been in operation for 20, 30 years. They were getting guys that all, all the guys they had 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 thousands of matches under their belt, lots of them, and had been a product of an evolutionary process. Uh, for, for years, It's it's like... Uh, they were like vaudeville performers where they were doing six shows a day and then they go on to the big stage. Okay. You know, so everybody was so ready. And then they didn't even use all of them. They just took the cream of that group. Right. <clears throat> so they had such good people. Then they could make them a sailor or a soldier or whatever, whatever fit in. And they, they, they knew how to do it because they might have been six different characters in their other career, right. you know. Who are you today? Who are you in Amarillo? Who are you in California, you know? So they were all... So now, they have people without that background. Mm -hmm. I, I have, you know, if you don't have it, I, you know, if, if you were born, if you were born in, in, in 1985, you know, you couldn't have been there in the 70s. You couldn't have been there. It's just not, it's not your fault. But to me, it's taken some of the luster away from it. I don't think they have as good. A, I know their performers aren't as good at what they do, and I don't think. I don't even think they look as good, but I didn't see everybody. I got a small sample here. Because they, they don't have wrong. that seasoning yeah. from being, a, you know, what works in Portland is not going to work in Florida. What works in Boston is not going to work in California. No. If your gimmick works in Florida and it works in Portland and it works in Vancouver or whatever, then you can't miss with it. Mm -hmm. with that. Now, what Terry tells me, Terry Funkin is a really good friend of mine. We both live in Amarillo, and we, we talk about things. He tells me about the WWE. I, I'm, he has experience with them that I don't. He said, Dennis, their matches are horrible. He said, they couldn't work like you in, in a million years. They got nobody that could do that. They can't really work. He said, I'll tell you what, how it would be. Because we'd have shows every week, and if I, I had a program with Dory Funk Jr. in Lubbock, Texas, we ran eight weeks in a row, house went up every week. House went up every week. He said, if these guys have matches, if they had matches four weeks in a row, he said, by the fourth week, they'd have nobody come to watch. He thinks it's that bad. He thinks that it's gone down that much. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I not said that, but I don't know. But I was un unimpressed with the independence for, for a while. And now I did go to Chicago and work with, uh, I don't know if you, they went, I think he went out of business. The guy, the Smashing Pumpkin guy was behind. Oh, okay. Um, and okay. Resistance Pro. Resistance. Okay. And they were idiots. <laughs> but they had some people that, that looked good, that, that kind of halfway knew what they were doing. But I got to be in the ring. I was a special referee or something. And man, I'm back in the ring. I'm at home. I'm comfortable. I'm more comfortable there than I would be sitting in this chair. And these guys are almost shaking. And I'm going, hey, man, this is where we're supposed to be. Relax. <laughs> you know? I can't. But by doing seven days a week and many, many times ten matches a week because I do TV, I might do three matches on TV. I might, I might do 15 matches in a week because I've worked twice so many times. But you just get so... The repetition just... You know, that's the difference between uh, me and them, in a way, is that if you're only going to work once a month, even if you're only going to work once a week, it's going to be a lot harder to figure it out than when you're working every day. Plus, when you're working with people, I worked with people in the, when I started in the 70s, all those guys were dressed in the 60s, and a lot of them in the 50s, and uh, some even in the 40s, I wrestled a guy named Jack Bentz at his first match in 1939. Wow. So my reach goes way back. But there's a collective knowledge that comes with that. I loved riding on trips with those guys. And if you can believe it, I wouldn't say a word because their stories were so good about all these, about the past and all these different things that happened. I was just wrapped attention listening to them. I just, I loved all the stories. and and. Uh, and uh, but 
So now, to their credit, John and Chris, to their credit, they brought me in here, and I and they have treated me like a star. You are a star. What are you talking about? <laughs> I am, but I'm not used to it. I'm not used to that kind of treatment. I'm used to being put down by my wife. You know, that's just married life, man. That's married life. Uh, I guess that goes with it. Oh, with the situation. Oh, this is going to be a certain extent. All this. <laughs> to a certain extent, but in 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 my life, it's like uh, when I did the roast of Terry Funk in New Jersey. They, uh, I got a standing ovation. Huh? And I go home, and they got an early flight, so they got me out and back in my living room at ten o'clock on Saturday night. I was supposed to spend the night there, but they got me home. <laughs> And I tell my granddaughter, who's about nine or ten, I said, "Honey, I said, I had a standing ovation. They wouldn't even sit down. They just kept standing there and clapping." She goes, "All right, bug man." Because she'd heard one of my customers one day we were out, and one of my customers said, "I know you. You're the bug man." <laughs> you know, so she's all right, bug man. So nobody calls me for like two years. I mean, I'm thinking there was superstar Graham. There was King Kong Bundy, there was David, uh, Kevin Von Erich, uh, Mike Graham, Kevin Sullivan, Missy Hyatt. There were a couple of uh, comedians from Philly, and uh, I absolutely. St and then the black guy was an absolute idiot. Black Jack or no Jack? No, something Jack. Jack. Yeah. Oh, no Jack. Idiot. Okay. Fucking idiot. Excuse me. <laughs> and I stole that show. Even the people that went to it, it cost you two hundred dollars to get into the damn thing. And they all came the next day to the autograph session, and every one of them said, "That was at the show." Said, "Damn, you were the best." <laughs> and some of them said, "Actually, used the term I loved." He said, "You stole the show." Two different people told me that you stole the show. That's so, a gimmick for you. The show stealer. But then, <laughs> okay. But here's the thing about being on top of Mount Everest: when you go back to Death Valley to live. How do you how do you how do you survive? I don't. I after two years after that, I get a phone call from somebody who I never recognized his name, who said he worked for the World Wrestling Entertainment. I had no idea what he was talking about. I didn't think in terms of WWE. So as I'm thinking it might be, I'm thinking it's a rib. It can't even be real. I never heard of this guy. My cell phone dropped the call. Oh. Never to be heard from again. And I called that number back, and that's the exchange, operator exchange that's in New York City. The office is in Connecticut. So says, we're not even in the same building. We're not even in the same state. I don't know who called you. If you don't know who called you, we can't help you. I said, well. So I called Terry, and he hadn't heard anything about it. So I said, well, maybe somebody's just messing around with me. But... Anyway, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know how long we've gone. I, I could spend days. I w I, we need to well, do like we a can whole do a long shoot interview. Um, we can do it. We can do it without the camera after the show. Oh, that sounds great. Now, right in, right? there was so much I really wanted to get into, but you've told some <laughs> great stories. Um, but before we wrap this up, because we're running out of time, you, you spoke a lot about the, the current product. What would be Dennis Stamp's message to anyone trying to get involved in the sport? Well, on a personal level, don't give up. I'm not going to say don't. <laughs> I, oh, no, no, no. Uh, I, I would never question anybody's dreams. Mm -hmm. Now, if, if, if you want to be a drug dealer, I would say, you know, there's a lot of bad side to that. Right. So I would be very careful. You want to kill people or whatever, I'd say, I, I, it's your dream. I buy. You're not getting my support. Yeah. Right. But you want to be a wrestler. I, if I don't understand, there's nobody in the world you're going to be able to tell it to. Because I still want to be out there, and I'm 68 years old. So I understand if you want to be there. Now, I really think, and I'll tell people straight up what they ask me, you need to have, you need to have some, it's a visual medium. It's a visual art form. And it's what they see. So you have to have something that people want to look at. You need a... I think you need a good body. We've always had big guys, and in our society, in our world, in our mindset, bigger is better when it comes to physicality. So big, muscled. Uh, I personally have seen the power of pretty faces on men, good-looking men. Oh, women 
would go for a face before they ever go for a body. And uh, uh, that's power. Personality is another thing. If you can, if you can uh, ex make your personality shine out bright enough for people to see it, to recognize it, whether it's on speaking, an interview, and particularly in the ring, that's another asset. So if you want to do it, you need to have something. Okay, you can maybe you can want to uh, drive an Indy 500, but you don't have a driver's license. I mean, there's some things, I don't care how much you want it, you aren't going to do it. Uh, an example, uh, one of my friends couldn't pass uh, classes in school when I was growing up. His mother said give him, she'd give him $50 for every A. You might as well make it $5 million, you know? <laughs> well, this is unrealistic. So I'm not saying that people don't have, people that have unrealistic expectations and think that they can do it and, and, and they really can't. But if you don't think you can do it, you're never going to be able to, for sure. So you have to have it in your head. And now, my advice, which I'll be talking to a lot of these guys probably after the matches, but my advice to the current indie, what I call, they're, they're, I didn't come up with this, but they're called indie wrestlers, right. independents, is they overthink it, they overdo it, they overact it, they over everything. They need to, first of all, first of all, I bet I've, I've said this a million times in the ring. One word, relax, relax, relax. You know, I, I, did, I did a lot of 60-minute matches. I did 60-minute matches with Terry Funk for the world title when he was world champion. People can't believe that you could go for 60 minutes. How do you do that? The key is you got to, first, first thing you got to do is you have to relax. Because if you're tense or excited, your energy's gone in a matter of minutes. You've got to relax. You've got to be in shape to do 60, right? Without question. But first thing you have to do is relax. And everybody overacts and overthinks it. But here's my perspective that I feel like they have in the Indies. They get, when we're doing seven days a week, okay, there's always tomorrow. But when you're only doing once a month, and maybe you don't even get every month, so when I do get my chance, I'm gonna show them everything. I gotta, I gotta give them the whole dinner, you know? They're getting everything. Everything I got to give, I gotta, I wanna impress so badly that I gotta give them everything. But what happens is, if you do too much, it's worse than not doing enough. Because then it, it runs together and it doesn't mean anything. If when, you know that you know that suplex where you get the guy upside down? Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't hardly have seen an independent match that they don't all open with that. One guy does it, then the other guy does it. So I go, okay, that move's destroyed. And this match is already set back five minutes. Now they gotta start all over again just to get to, to get to the starting point. And then I'll probably see some of it tonight. To me, the ring is the stage. The ring is the stage. That's where you want to show the action. If you go out on the floor, first thing you do is you lose a per portion of your audience, a percentage of your audience. They can't see what you're doing. They can't see you because you're on the floor. And then the second thing that they invariably always do is they totally disregard the referee and the count. So the referee counts to nine. Then he has to do a turnaround or something, a pirouette, and start over again and count to nine. And he's got to, and so we totally bury the referee. So that ruins the whole, it hurts, it doesn't ruin, but it hurts the whole car right. in my mind. And then everybody's wanting to have, you know, to me, one-on-one. -on -one. Tag team is hard, it's a hard thing to work. It's easy if you know it, you can done it. But it's a hard thing to work. Six men, really hard. And they do all these goofy things where they got a kangaroo and a girl on this team and you know and a pit bull and I mean and then you've got a, the pit bull biting the kangaroo over here and you got the woman pulling somebody's hair over here and then you got two people in the middle of the ring and what is anybody watching? Whatever they are, they're not all watching the same thing. Right. So if I'm in the ring, if I'm in the ring and I'm in a tag and and the the tag team of the guys that are outside, they start something, boom, I'm going to the, I'm getting a headlock, and we're going to lay in the middle of the ring. 
until you get done with trying to steal my audience. You know, you won't want to want you to divide the audience. I want the, the middle of the ring. The ring is a stage. That's where everybody can see it. That's where it should happen. Now, you can use those things, but do it bang, bang, and you're back in the ring. Go out and throw them into the chairs, maybe, and then you're back in the ring. You know, let him sell it, maybe. If To break the count, you might go in the referee's way to break the count, but it's all a part, you know, it works. I'm not saying don't ever leave the ring. Hell, I was really good at bailing. As a heel, as the baby face, it's even, it's even, it's even. I cheat a little bit. He gets me back. He gets me back. He's starting to uh, counter everything I do, so I just bail. Now everybody, God damn, just when you thought you had him, he's out. But dang, I'm right back in the other side now. I'm not spending any time on the floor. So I, want, I want people to see me. That's why I'm out there. I can tell you one that you should put on. I've talked to thousands of wrestlers probably. And every one of them, if you ever ask them, every one of them, if you ever ask them why, they would all tell you the same thing. It's for the money. They all be lying to you. The reason they do it, money is a reason, but it's not the reason. The reason is people come to watch. It's I understand. I am of an attention deficit. I need more attention. You know, I need somebody pat me on the head saying, "Oh, Denny, what a good boy." <laughs> I need that. So I can get that in the ring. It doesn't matter if they're booing me. If they're watching me, that's all I need. That's all I need. They've got to be paying attention. Even the people, now, that are trying to get at me, I, I don't care. I've had, that. I've had a few tough trips from the ring to the dressing room. One time in Pueblo, we had to go up some stairs, and Dory Funk was in the ring bleeding. I don't believe in blood, but his blood. He wanted it, so he's in the ring bleeding. So they got six cops around me, walking me through the crowd and up the stairs. And they got a guy behind me, another wrestler, Alex Perez, and he's a puncher, and he's punch drunk anyway. And he's swinging, he's cussing, he's squeezing at people. And I'm, I'm just breezing. I said, hey, Alex, you take this shit too seriously. Come on, you gotta relax, man. As we go up the stairs, somebody reaches over the top of the stairs and punches me in the top of the head. I fucking lose it. I break out of the cops. I run up this platform. There's about 150 people there, like a dummy. And I go, all right, who did it? You know, like they're going to step up, right? Like they're going to step up. But I was so mad. And I was in such a rage that it was just like the Red Sea parting. No one would take one step near me. Now, I'm thinking later, I'm thinking, damn. You're backing off 150 people? What? Are you insane? You're gonna, they're going to give you your head to carry home with you one of these days. But they saw I was so mad. But it, the funny part really was, I'm laughing about it until I get punched. <laughs> and then it's not. Then it's not funny anymore. So, but uh, I, I had to laugh at myself. All right, who did it? <laughs> They're going to come and tell me, yeah. Oh, I hit you, by the way. <laughs> uh, I've got some, uh, you're sweating a little bit. My, my knuckles are still wet. I don't know. Well, Dennis, there's so much I would love to, to, to sit and talk to you. We, we're out of time. We're going to kick us off the internet here. But I want to thank you so much for being here with us thank today at AIW. Me. we got to do this again more often because I'm sure you've got tales. No, but I haven't got, I'm, I'm waiting for the softball question. <laughs> I, I, we're, we're way past the softball question. Thank you again, Dennis. And again, this has been Behind the Curtain for AIW.